Excellent. Good afternoon, everyone. And Cora, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you great. Excellent. Wonderful. It's a beautiful snowy day in Ithaca, New York. We're all excited about getting out skiing tomorrow after our 12 inches of snow that we had on Monday. Um, and I'm a little bit intimidated because I see a few other experts on the list of attendees. So um, they will help keep me in check, I guess. But nice to see a bunch of uh, friends and experts on the, on the call. Um, so I was asked to talk about adjusting nutrients in a closed irrigation system. And Cora, thanks to you and the University of Connecticut for uh, hosting this uh, series. That's great. Um, then uh, uh, as uh, part of the talk today, um, we'll talk just a little bit about the fundamentals of nutrient solution management in hydroponics. Um, I did work closely with Dr. Curry at Iowa State, so I'm hopefully not overlapping uh, much with his content um, that he presented on the, the Monday uh, webinar. Uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, common nutrient imbalances that we see occur in um, closed irrigation of um, uh, leafy greens. Uh, then um, I'm going to ask you all to put on your your math cap or your thinking cap because we're going to be doing a bunch of calculations and so they asked me to do an intermediate level talk so we'll we'll include a bunch of math as part of that and we're going to look at a case study um, where we're adjusting nutrients in a deep water culture system where we're hoping to to keep using the same water for several crop cycles um, and then we'll end with just a few additional uh, resources um, and uh, concluding thoughts. So it should be the makings of a good good uh, little uh, time together here. Um, so overall our goal in, in hydroponic nutrient solution management is really to supply nutrients to meet plant demands, um, which is difficult, right? Plant nutrient demands will vary based on crop growth stage and the environment. Um, and so scientists have tried developing these predictive models and they, they work okay, um, but in the end we end up doing lots of uh, nutrient solution testing or plant tissue testing to see what the plants are really taking up uh, and then do adjustments from there. And the reason we're trying to match supply and demand is because if we undersupply certain nutrients, they're going to go down over time in this, this recirculating system and we're going to end up with problems with uh, nutrient deficiencies. Um, if we oversupply certain nutrients, we won't necessarily have these, these nutrient deficiencies, um, but what can develop over time is, is certain nutrients will build up and other ones will um, go down, um, and this oversupply of nutrients can cause nutrient antagonisms, where too much of one nutrient can reduce the uptake of another nutrient. You can also get buildup of excess salinity, so just overall high EC, which can limit plant growth, um, and then there can be sometimes specific nutrient toxicities as well. Um, and I won't go th all through this table, but uh, just as a reminder for us, there are um, about uh, 14 of these essential uh, plant nutrients um, besides uh, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen that we're trying to supply as mineral elements. Um, and these are the rough uh, percentages that they need to be in the plant. So if we have a million atoms of nitrogen in a plant, we only need uh, one or two atoms of, of molybdenum, for example. Um, however, that uh, those micronutrients are just as important and the plant won't be able to um, complete its life cycle in a, in a healthy way or a high quality way if it doesn't have those micronutrients as well. Um, so the, the overall tools that we have to keep a nutrient program in check is, of course, uh, pH and EC uh, measurements, um, and we'll talk uh, very briefly about those. Um, laboratory analysis of either the nutrient solution that, that we're recirculating, um, as well as uh, periodically checking the plant tissue itself to make sure that uh, what the plant is taking up um, which is kind of an integration of, of the nutrient solution supply and the environmental conditions, um, that is important as well. Um, and then we are hoping to manage things in such a way that the plants won't develop uh, nutrient disorders, um, but we can also use visual symptoms uh, to uh, help determine if those, other, if those other two points have failed, um, then we should try to notice things visually on the plant as soon as possible and um, troubleshoot and make corrections. Um, so for uh, pH uh, management, um, 
we're trying to get this this pH that's about between 5.4 and 6. Um, and the reason that we do it is to uh, balance um, uptake. So there's some nutrients um, like iron, manganese, boron, zinc, and copper that are not very soluble and plant available at high pH. And then there's some other nutrients uh, like calcium and magnesium um, that are not prevalent or not accessible to the plant at, at low pH. Um, at that low pH, you can also get toxicity of um, certain ions as well, like iron and manganese. It's electrical conductivity measurements. It's a measure of the total salts that are dissolved in the nutrient solution. Um, and in general, a low EC would mean a lack of adequate fertilizer. It doesn't tell us what is lacking. It just says overall there's um, not the expected amount of, of salts dissolved in water. Um, and a high EC would be um, too much fertilizer which is either we're um, exceeding crop demands when we're supplying fertilizer, um, or if we have a, a system where leaching is taking place in like container grown plants, it could also mean insufficient um, leaching and then too high of an EC building up in the root zone. For our um, hydroponic leafy greens and herbs, um, a very common um, EC target would be on the level of 1.4 uh, to 2.2 decisiemens per meter. So those are kind of basic tools that we that we have. Um, typically for an NFT system um, or a deep water culture system, or, or which is also called raft pond hydroponics, um, a base uh, part of nutrient solution management is making sure that every day you're testing pH and EC um, and adjusting them. So if your pH is drifting high over time, which is common, you're adding um, acid. Um, to keep the pH in that in that suggested range of like 5.4 to 6.0. Um, as well with, with EC, we want to, to uh, test it um, at least every day, if not more, um, and we can um, add more fertilizer solution if our EC is drifting down. Um, in terms of management with NFT, um, typically we have a relatively small volume of water per plant. If you compare that to like like deep water culture, um, where you often have um, uh, eight or 10 inches of water um, and a really large volume um, per plant. So in NFT, you have a, a relatively small volume of water per plant, um, which means that nutrient imbalances can occur relatively quickly. Um, and one of the strategies that is followed is um, kind of a drain and dump strategy, um, which is of course not so sustainable in terms of water and fertilizer use. Um, but it would be to drain that relatively small reservoir um, of nutrients, um, perhaps every 10 to 14 days, um, and then completely rebuild the, the nutrient solution. So you were still maintaining EC in that NFT system, um, but the problem is that over a two week period of time, um, some elements can accumulate and, and um, so they will contribute to EC um, versus other elements will go down. And so you'll look at the EC readings and they'll, they'll stay, stay, stay stable, but some nutrients will be um, deficient and not at the, the levels that the plants need. So um, this draining and replacing nutrients every couple weeks is one tool that we have to use. Um, the other uh, possibility that we can do is, um, is send a nutrient solution sample to a laboratory, get an analysis back, and then actually make adjustments. We'll be talking quite a bit about this in our case study later. Um, with NFT, if you're doing the, the drain every couple weeks uh, type of model, um, the initial water quality is not so important. So if you have um, uh, somewhat higher EC to begin with, it should still be less than um, one to begin with um, before adding nutrients to it. Um, and if you have some sodium and chloride in there, it's it's not as important because it's only going to be used for two weeks. The longer that we reuse a nutrient solution, so if we reuse it for multiple crop cycles, um, then we really have, have to worry about our initial water quality. And so sodium and chloride can accumulate uh, and um, become at levels that are harmful to the plant um, or just overall contribute to the electrical conductivity of the nutrient solution um, but not um, contribute, you know, to the, to the nutritional value of the nutrient solution. So in um, pond and deep water culture production, um, we would have a, this larger volume of water. 
Um, and because we're starting with this large volume of, of water per plant, our hope is to use it for several crop cycles. Uh, because if we had to dump it out between every crop cycle or every couple of weeks, um, that would be large amounts of wasted uh, water and fertilizer. So in this model of production, it's, it's important to start with higher quality water. And it's most common to start with reverse osmosis water. So that will, um, that will decrease the EC, right? It, you'll, it will um, make your EC be very close to zero, um, as well as uh, remove the individual salts and make their concentrations quite low. So if there was a sodium and chloride uh, concern with the, the water source, it will remove that, for example. Um, and it is more expensive to, um, to install this reverse osmosis system um, up front, but then um, by virtue of using that uh, same water for several crop cycles and not dumping it out, um, uh, that, will, that will help to make up for the cost. Um, and then in, in deep water culture, the nice thing is this, this uh, large volume of water is a pretty good buffer so that nutrient levels don't change dramatically from day to day, and pH and EC won't change as dramatically from day to day as they will in NFT. We should still be uh, testing and adjusting them every day. Um, but then it's important to do a laboratory analysis every one to two weeks um, and make adjustments to the, the nutrient solution in the pond based on the laboratory analysis. And we'll go into a bunch of that during the case study. Um, so you would be uh, monitoring and managing pH and EC either by hand um, or there are also different automated systems on the market that will do this. Um, some of the, the more simple and affordable systems are controlling three things. So you typically have three different stock tanks in A, B, and C. And um, what the, what the um, unit will do is it will have a pH sensor and an EC sensor, and it's taking um, continuous readings. Um, and then there's a, there's a control box that will uh, check if, if uh, EC falls below a threshold then it will turn on uh, two peristaltic pumps to pump in um, nutrient solution A and B um, until you reach that EC threshold. Um, so that way, at least in terms of EC or total salts, you'll maintain uh, continuous EC. Uh, in terms of pH, um, you typically only have the ability to control pH in one way. So it's common with our nitrate-based fertilizers um, and with water that has a bit of alkalinity that our pH will drift up over time. So in this case, you have a stock tank that has an acid. Um, and then um, when your pH goes above a threshold, the peristaltic pump turns on um, and you add some acid to your nutrient solution until you reach your, your pH uh, target. Um, I'll mention, um, because this will come up later in the case study, um, an example of a nutrient solution recipe for lettuce. Um, and I've written about different recipes. Some are easier. Some are like using calcium nitrate in tank A and then using um, a semi-complete hydroponic fertilizer such as 51226 in tank B. Um, and those are great in that they're, they're simple, easy to use. You're only mixing up two bags of fertilizer um, in different stock tanks. Um, with, with that type of fertilizer program, if there are nutrient deficiencies or toxicities, it's, it's, you can't just use that bag of semi-complete fertilizer to correct for your problems because you'll be adding all the other nutrients along with that. Um, so for more precise application, um, uh, we have um, uh, recipes like this. So this one comes from the Netherlands, uh, from uh, Dr. Sonneveld, and the uh, lettuce recipe. And this one has been well used by our, our Cornell Controlled Environment Agriculture Program for, for decades now. So the tank A has us using calcium nitrate and things that are complementary and won't precipitate with calcium nitrate. Um, and then uh, tank B has us adding the uh, potassium phosphate, magnesium sulfate, um, and then almost all of the micronutrients except for iron. Um, and this is a recipe for mixing up 100 gallons of nutrient solution, or if you're using a 1 to 100 injector to mix this up in a stock tank, this would be for making up one gallon of fertilizer stock. And you can read all about the hydroponic recipes at our Cornell uh, website. 
Um, this um, article will talk about a couple other strategies um, for um, getting similar uh, target values. And so we have our Sonneveld solution target values um, on the right here. And you can see, um, so a, a common strategy is using calcium nitrate plus the semi-complete fertilizer. And so these, these recipes um, were adjusted to have the same parts per million um, nitrogen, but then they do vary somewhat in, in their other nutrients, like their phosphorus and potassium, um, calcium, and um, iron, for example. Um, what part of this means is that you can get away with uh, decent variation um, and still grow um, quite healthy plants. And on, on Monday, um, Dr. Curry from Iowa State talked about um, different ECs and growing, growing herbs in different ECs, um, so long as enough of the nutrient was supplied in the nutrient solution, um, he, he could get uh, quite similar um, results. Um, and then um, I'm going to ask you to put on your math cap for a second here. Um, um, and this will be important for um, our case study discussion. So just to remind you, if you needed to mix up a target uh, part per million of a certain um, nutrient, um, a couple things to keep in mind is that one part per million is the same as one milligram uh, per liter of water. So um, if we need to use calcium nitrate, for example, and we want to supply um, 100 parts per million of nitrogen with calcium nitrate, this is how we can calculate how much to, to use in a liter of water. So we need to know the percentage nitrogen in the fertilizer. So we look at the fertilizer label and see that the percentage nitrogen is 15.5% uh, or represented as a decimal that would be 0.155. Um, and so this uh, calculation that we do is we just divide our target uh, parts per million or milligrams per liter of nitrogen divided by the percent nitrogen that's in the bag, which is 0.155. And it tells us that we need to use 645 uh, milligrams uh, fertilizer in one liter of water. Um, and then if you remember, milligrams are, are a very small weight measurement. Um, there's 1,000 milligrams in a gram. Um, so this would be 0.645 grams. Um, and then um, the other thing that we should calculate at the same time is this fertilizer also provided us with calcium. So we want to see how much calcium was provided when we mixed up that fertilizer to provide 100 parts per million nitrogen. So what we need to know is the milligrams of fertilizer that was used, and then we multiply that in this case. So we multiply it times the percent calcium. Um, so we have our 645 milligrams of fertilizer, multiply that times 0.19, and it tells us that we're getting 122.6 parts per million calcium. And then um, that's great for, for making up one liter of water, but what if I have, uh, for example, a 55-gallon stock tank, um, and then I'm using a 1 to 100 injector? Um, so then I need to account for conversions of converting liters to gallons, and then the fact that I'm using a 55-gallon stock tank, and then multiplying that times 100 to account for the, the 1 to 100 injector. So in this case, we um, knew that we needed 645 milligrams of fertilizer per liter of water. Um, we're going to convert that to um, how many we would need in one gallon, so multiply that times our conversion factor of 3.785 liters per gallon. And we're going to multiply that times 55 gallons uh, to account for our stock tank size, and then multiply times 100 to account for our injector ratio. So this tells us that we need some very large number of milligrams. We need 13,427,000 milligrams. So then let's go ahead and convert that into grams, so it's an easier number to look at. So we just divide that by 1,000 because uh, there's 1,000 milligrams in a gram, and it tells us that we need 13,427 grams. Um, or you could convert that to kilograms, right? And it would be 13.427 kilograms. Okay, this, this uh, fertilizer calculations will all come in handy in a couple minutes here with our case study. So in uh, um, nutrient solution uh, management in deep water culture in NFT, um, some of the common nutrient imbalances that will occur are some nutrients that will become depleted over time. And these are ones that are, the plant is taking up in greater proportion 
then they're actually supplied by the fertilizer, and then their, their nutrient concentration is going to decrease. So uh, a couple common examples are N, P, and K. Um, just because they are the macronutrients that are needed in the largest quantities by the plant, um, it's fairly common that these are rapidly uh, taken up from the solution um, and their concentrations are decreasing over time. Uh, manganese, one of these uh, micronutrients that we need in, in quite small quantities. Interestingly, this might also be lost rapidly from um, hydroponic situations um, because um, manganese oxidizing bacteria can become established. So um, especially if you use the same uh, reservoir or the same pond for several crop cycles, um, these are naturally occurring bacteria. They're not harmful to the plant in any way other than they, they um, um, use mang manganese in their own metabolism. And so this will cause um, the manganese available for the, the plant to be lost rapidly. Um, there are also issues with nutrients or elements that can accumulate, and so this would be in the case that they're taken up by the plant in lower proportion than they are supplied, meaning their concentration increases over time. And examples of this would be calcium and magnesium and sulfur, um, so often supplied at like macronutrient levels, but not taken up as quickly as like N, P, and K. Uh, and, um, uh, sodium and chloride also as, as, um, as nutrients that we really don't want in very high concentrations. If sodium and chloride are in the water source and they haven't been, and there's not a reverse osmosis system to filter them out, um, they will get taken up um, at very low levels by the plant, and so they're just going to build up over time in the nutrient solution. So um, issues with these nutrient imbalances may be that the EC is on target, um, but um, like we talked about, certain nutrients may become deficient because they're taken up in higher proportion, and then some elements will be in excess because they're taken up in, um, uh, in lower proportion than, than what they're supplied. Um, and this can cause uh, problems with nutrient antagonisms, which can limit uptake of other nutrients. So for example, if there's higher sodium, it can limit um, calcium uptake or magnesium uptake, um, or high chloride could limit, limit nitrate uptake. Um, if we, so that's if we're like tracking the same EC, we can, we can develop these deficiencies or these, um, these nutrient imbalances. Um, we could, if we're not um, targeting a specific EC, then what can happen is that higher EC may, may develop and so that these high salts may injure the roots um, or cause um, excess elements that can cause toxicities or antagonisms. And so the solutions that we have are to um, uh, add specific fertilizer salts to the pond or reservoir, so if certain nutrients become deficient, um, we can add only those specific fertilizer salts to the pond. Um, then if this is a continual pattern that, that we see certain things accumulate and other things um, become deficient, it suggests that our base nutrient recipe should be tweaked. Remember these nutrient recipes should be thought of as, as, um, as good starting points for a program, um, but probably you know, may not be um, always appropriate in every situation based on environmental conditions. Um, then um, if sodium and chloride accumulate, uh, it suggests that we uh, need to use reverse osmosis water um, or select fertilizers that are low in sodium and chloride, which can sometimes be unwanted byproducts in fertilizer. Um, and if we don't have the option to use reverse osmosis water to begin with, um, or things get really out of, out of whack, um, then we get to the point where we, we may need to either bleed a fraction of the pond or reservoir, so um, um, waste and discharge some fraction of the nutrient solution so that we can reblend it with water um, and, a, and a new fraction of the nutrient solution, or in some cases we may need to drain the whole pond or reservoir. Um, when we do this, we also need to make sure that we're following any um, uh, water discharge requirements. And so you need to make sure that your operation um, has a plan to discharge these large volumes of water.
Um, and um, so we'll, we'll go into this case study then. Um, and um, important in this is looking at uh, analysis from a commercial lab. So you will send um, pond nutrient solution or NFT reservoir samples to a lab. And they're going to analyze them for pH and EC. Um, and then as well, uh, you'll want to look at the different macronutrients and the micronutrients and whether they're on target. Also, you'll want to look at the ratio of calcium to magnesium, and this would go into to nutrient antagonisms. We typically try to maintain a three to one ratio. And then we also want to look at the sodium and chloride levels and um, check that they're less than 70 um, parts per million. Um, so this case study will look at adjusting nutrients in a closed irrigation system. So this comes from actually a, a commercial facility um, that was in deep water culture. Um, and in general, the strategy that, that's followed is um, pH and EC adjustments are made daily. So in a pond, you're, you're always adding um, new water every day to make up for what the crop transpired. Um, you're also adding um, fertilizer in that water. So typically following your base um, uh, nutrient recipe. Um, so that way um, we make sure that certain nutrients don't become deficient um, before uh, you can make adjustments following uh, laboratory tests. Then every week or every two weeks, um, especially w once you get well established in your operation, um, every two weeks with a large volume of water can make sense for getting a laboratory test. Um, then um, we will make adjustments to individual nutrients. And then if, um, if we're seeing patterns over time that just making these adjustments every two weeks, um, we're still seeing issues with some nutrients accumulating and some um, becoming deficient, then we would actually start to make changes to the base recipe of the stock solutions and kind of the target nutrient values that we're looking at. So um, here's an example with um, uh, deep water culture. It's in a pond that's uh, 120 feet long and 20 feet wide with uh, 10 inches deep of water. It's been growing lettuce in hydroponic uh, ponds for several crop cycles. And um, uh, the target nutrient solution we use in this case is a modified Sonneveld's lettuce recipe. Um, so here's our, our target PPM that this operation is looking for. Then um, a uh, sample was sent to a laboratory for analysis. And so we want to compare the lab analysis to the, um, the target, um, both from an absolute value standpoint, so how many parts per million um, are different for each of the nutrients, but also from a percentage standpoint. So for the micronutrients, for example, um, a small fraction of a PPM difference, um, absolute value, may be a big uh, percentage uh, difference. And um, in particular, we're going to focus on elements that are more than 25% off from their suggested thresholds. So this is what it looks like. Oops, sorry, let me back up. This is what it looks like um, when we layer those on top of each other. So we have our, our target PPM, our laboratory analysis, and then we have the difference in milligrams per liter, and then we have the percent difference. And so in this case, um, we have three nutrients, phosphorus, potassium, and manganese, that are quite below their targets. And then several of these nutrients that are actually um, above their targets. Um, and so let's uh, first account for those low nutrients. So th this is something that we can take action on is adding um, fertilizer salts to adjust for these nutrients. So we need um, uh, 8.27 8 parts per million of phosphorus, 90.33 of potassium, and 0 0.09 of manganese. So the strategy that we'll look at is we'll select a fertilizer source for each of these elements. We'll calculate how much we need to add for each one liter of water. And then we'll also uh, multiply that by the size of the pond. 
Um, and here's one resource that I like to use is um, uh, a manual that comes out of the Netherlands that was published in 2016. Um, and we can share the slides so you can you can get the link and not have to um, try to furiously write this down. <coughs> Excuse me. This will have um, several detailed crop recipes, but it also has some really good information on the elements that we're typically using in building hydroponic nutrient solutions. Um, so it'll list different forms that we have available and then their typical percentage that they are in the um, according to the fertilizer label. And you always want to uh, spot check this or check each label um, because each company's formulation may be slightly different. For calcium nitrate, for example, if it's 15.5% nitrogen or 15% nitrogen may vary based on the company. So for uh, potassium and phosphorus, what we're going to use is monopotassium phosphate at first. So we're going to use that to um, make up for the phosphorus that we need. And I specifically chose that because uh, potassium was also low, right? So that's going to give us some potassium. Um, and then um, it will turn out that we still need some additional potassium. So at that point, we will go to using uh, potassium nitrate. Um, and in this case, we use kind of these same uh, fertilizer calculations that I went through where we need 8.27 parts per million of phosphorus. So that's our target. We divide that by a, uh, 0.227 because the percentage uh, phosphorus is 22.7. And it tells us that we need 36.4 milligrams of that fertilizer per liter of our nutrient solution. This also supplies us some potassium. So we have to, in this case, multiply. So we take the 36.4 milligrams per liter, milligrams that we were adding, multiply that times 0.287, and it tells us that we're getting um, 10.5 milligrams of potassium. So it turns out we still need almost 80 milligrams of potassium, so we're going to have to use uh, a potassium nitrate in this case to add potassium. So for the potassium nitrate, um, we need about 80 parts per million. We'll divide that by the percentage potassium, so 0.386. And it tells us that we need to use 206.8 milligrams per liter. Um, we can also calculate how much nitrogen this supplies us, which is about 28.33 parts per million nitrogen. And it is going to increase then our pond nitrogen from 158 parts per million to 186.3 parts per million. Um, and then last, we need our source of manganese, so this micronutrient that can, that can sometimes go low. We're going to use uh, manganese sulfate in this case. So this manganese sulfate, we need uh, overall, you know, very low amount, 0 0.09 parts per million um, manganese. But but um, in relative terms, this was becoming quite deficient. So we divide our target by uh, 0.325, and it tells us that we need two, uh, 0.2769 milligrams per liter. Um, there is a tiny, tiny bit of sulfur that we're also providing in this fertilizer, but because it's a micronutrient and we're providing such small amounts, um, we don't need to account for that sulfur. Um, it would be a negligible amount. So then we need to um, determine how many liters of water are in our pond. So in this case, it's a simple math of it's 120 feet uh, long by 20 feet wide by 10 inches deep. Um, so we can calculate first the cubic feet, so it's 120 feet by 20 feet um, by 10 twelfths of a foot. Um, so it's 2,000 cubic feet of, of pond water. Then we need the conversion factor that there are 7.48 gallons per cubic foot. So we, it is 14,960 gallons of water. Um, and then, uh, because our math is helpful to do using liters and milligrams, we want to convert that to liters. Um, so we multiply that times 3.785, and it tells us that there were 56,624 uh, liters of water. So then the last thing we need to do is multiply the, we did the calculations for one liter of water, we need to multiply each of those times 56,624, and it tells us that we need 2,000 uh, grams of monopotassium phosphate, 11,000 grams of potassium nitrate, 
and 15.68 grams of manganese sulfate. Um, so if we go back and look at how this will change things, um, it now brought our phosphorus, potassium, and manganese back on track. So they're, they're at our target levels. Um, it did bring our nitrogen up. So now our nitrogen is 31% above target, um, which is not a huge problem. And then in general, we can see that a bunch of things like calcium, magnesium, sulfur, and then um, other micronutrients are also above target. So this would suggest uh, to me that, that future adjustments would be need, needed. Um, several of these nutrients are high. Um, the crop must be taking these up in lower proportion than it's supplied in our base fertilizer recipe. So we would consider adjusting the target values in our base recipe. Um, so if we go back to that Sonneveld's um, uh, solution and that recipe, um, I always want to make these gradual changes. I hate making like night and day kind of changes and then um, having the crop suffer uh, because of that. So what I would like, I would foresee doing is, is decreasing the target for these um, elements that were running high, um, decrease their target values in the Sonneveld's uh, solution by 25%. Um, and then as we replenish our pond water, we're using that, that um, nutrient solution that's 25% lower in those elements. Um, Reevaluate those at my next laboratory analysis and then see if I should make uh, some further changes over time. Um, I will just uh, point out um, that there are some resources available for visual diagnosis of nutrient disorders um, at egrow.org. Um, so I have these for lettuce, basil, and arugula. There's some also really nice other technical troubleshooting um, extension articles at egrow.org. Um, and also just to point out that the environment can also cause nutrient disorders as well. So here is an example of um, what looks like, say, iron deficiency on basil that was not due to problems with not having enough iron in the nutrient solution, but it was due to the roots having uh, pythium root rot. Um, and there are um, labs that will do tissue testing, which is another good way to make sure that your, um, the plants are actually taking up what you're uh, providing them. Um, and you can do that to solve nutrient disorders or to proactively um, test tissue to track it over time to make sure that you're staying on track. Um, and you can find um, these uh, different uh, suggested sufficiency ranges from the uh, commercial laboratories that you send your samples to. So with that, I'll thank you. I ran a, a bit long here, um, but hopefully Cora will still give us time to answer some of the questions. Thank you, everyone.